we call it. And uh, thank you for taking time out. I know Friday evenings are typically busy. Uh, for most of my guests, it's, a, it's an end of the week. There are calls to be had. There are webinars to go to, I'm told. So thank you for prioritizing on ours today. And I'm really, really happy to have two of you come and join us today. Two people uh, who I personally know, uh, but interestingly, two people who I have never really worked with. You're the first pair on my panel who I have never worked with. Although I realize I know Joy for about 30 plus years when I was in school and he was in college and he was a quiz master. Or you just passed college, I think. You were still doing quizzes in Kolkata and I was in the school team. And Steve and I, or rather I've had the misfortune of playing against Steve in football and he's run circles around us. He's still a very, very, very mean player at that. So thank you for making it. Um, the way today's agenda is, it's exactly what it was in the last few sessions. We are... We are going to have a few slides that I'm going to have right now in terms of, you know, describing my participants, talking about them a little bit, and then handing it over to you to, you know, talk. Then we'll have a three-way conversation for the first 20, 25 minutes, and then over to the audience to ask questions. And typically, this is the best part. I get some fantastic questions coming in from really a great audience that I have. And... Uh, that's exactly how it will be. We will, uh, with your permission, as I mentioned, extend by maybe about 10 minutes today because people have said that 6.30 is too early to end. And if people want to stay on, we'll probably have another 10, 15 minutes of the chat. And then we hope to end by 6.45. So with that, formally, uh, welcome and let's get started. I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to talk about who we are because I was told that this is supposed to be a webinar hygiene point because people more normally know the guests, nobody knows the host. So I thought I'm going to take a minute to kind of tell you about us. So my name is Anurban and we, we run two organizations. One is called the Painted Sky. We've been doing 15 years in uh, learning and development and uh, leadership development, executive coaching, etc. And of course, design thinking. And design thinking remains our forte. And of course, that led us to open the first design thinking school in Asia, which is called Ubiquity, which is just a word play on the word Ubiquity, the philosophy of design being everywhere. The big reason was Ubiquity, spelt Ubiquity was not available. So <laughs> that's why it is spelled the way it is spelled. Um, well done. Yeah, thank you so much. Joy. <laughs> so quickly, uh, let me do the introductions. As I mentioned, I know Joy for 30 plus years, but I don't know. I think Joy knows me because we've never, never really interacted. Uh, now, of course, I know him on Facebook and uh, he's prolific on Facebook, not in terms of volume, but in terms of what he posts. I've not come across anyone whose um, posts are so thought provoking, so well researched. And of course, he's a quiz master from the past. So his, his, he's just the level of information he shares is just incredible. So Joy, as you know, leads the professional volleyball league in India. And before that, uh, which obviously pretty much titillates everyone, is that he was a part of the original IPL founding fathers, I would call it, being present in the original auction. He was the team director for Kolkata Knight Riders. And later on, what I think we are all particularly proud of is Joy bringing the FIFA Under-17 World Cup to India, which was a fantastic success. Uh, before that, of course, Joy has been a media person all his life, heading programming for... History Channel, National Geographic, ESPN, Star Sports, etc. And he's a prolific writer. His, uh, his columns come out in newspapers all the time. And of course, his trivia quiz, as somebody's telling me on the chat immediately, is Twitter. On Twitter, he's prolific and his trivia quiz is fantastic. It's amazingly inspiring. Thank you so much, Sheila, for pointing that out. Thank you, Joy. And before I move on to Steve, I just wanted to tell you that I've stolen this picture from your Facebook page. Spot Joy if you can. If you can't, he's sitting next to another fam famous Bengali. <laughs> right. So thank you and welcome to our uh, session today. Thank you for making it. Thank you. I like to remind you of this picture. This is actually a happy picture. This is one uh -huh. of the few times in that 2008 season, the first season, which were happy. So this is we've just beaten Punjab in the last match, and I remember this this evening because after this we went over to Shorab Ganguly's restaurant. And had a really nice meal out there. So yeah, I remember this picture very distinctly. Uh, 
Fantastic. I think one of the big reasons that we follow Joy on Facebook is these amazing stories of Saurav Ganguly and Shah Rukh Khan and Wasim Akram. We follow very avidly. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Okay. Steve Dykes. Steve Dykes. Okay. The reason why Steve Dykes, the words are less is because it's very difficult to get Steve Dykes to tell us anything about himself. Okay. <laughs> uh, Malika, my co-producer here, has been pestering him to come up with a good profile, but all I get are a few bullet points. Okay. So Steve is somebody I, as I mentioned to you, I know Steve again as a friend. Uh, we have played football together. Our kids play football together. So that's how I know him very well. And Steve leads Decathlon for India. And he's the coach for West Asia. Steve has spent some 22 years, I think, with Decathlon now, of which the last seven have been in India. Uh, very interestingly, Steve played for Wigan Athletic um, as a professional footballer in the late 80s. But I think he had an ankle injury that kind of cut short his football career. Otherwise, he would probably be coaching some EPL team today, for all we know, or playing for all I know. So, uh, and Steve has been leading Decathlon India for seven years. And I think what I've been particularly impressed by that story is that while we work a lot in design thinking with organized retail and pretty much across the board, it's been a season of lament. Uh, economy, job, disposable income. And if there's any organization in this space that has kind of broken that trend is Decathlon. I think Steve once told me that when he took over seven years ago, Decathlon had about three or four stores. And right now they're pushing 80 in the last seven years. And anyone who has visited a Decathlon and it's very difficult to find one who hasn't is first of all, completely blown away by what they have in the store. And as Joy was pointing out, mountain gear and uh, roller blades and camping equipment, you walk out. He's like that Tintin figure, Senor Di Oliveira, who could sell, you know, soaps to the Bedouin. But more importantly, uh, you always find families having fun in Decathlon. There are kids playing football, families, you know, shooting a hoop. It's like a picnic out there. And I think that to a large extent, I found has had tremendous impact of popularizing sports. And I see a lot of people doing a lot of buying or picking up fantastic things and, uh, you, you know, taking these forward. And I think they become avid sports fans of those sports that probably they weren't familiar with earlier. So I, I'm really impressed with what you've done in the last seven years in retail in sports retail and of course, sports culture. And True to form, my two pictures of Steve, one I researched and found was when he was moving into oh, Decathlon. Well, 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 yeah. yeah, well done. <laughs> Thank you so much. And the second one is what Steve shared with me today. And I think that picture is what Decathlon stands for in India. Kids rollerblading, skateboarding, doing something which is so, so interesting, so inspiring. So again, I know it's a working day for you. Thank you, Steve, for joining. And it's well, a pleasure you. to have you. Thank you. Okay. So with that, we now get into the, uh, this part of our conversation. So um, we have a topic and the topic is, of course, when we started about five weeks ago, it was in the middle of the lockdown and uh, the world looked a lot less certain than it does now. But even now, I think we're still in the middle of that storm and we really don't know which way we will surface. So the topic remains that what is leadership in this disrupted world that uh, all our lives we have talked of vision 2020 and none of us could have thought 2020 would look like this. So no vision really prepared us for this. So my two guests, my conversation with you today would kind of hinge around that. So I'm going to stop the share and we're going to get back on uh, the view that I prefer. So since I ended with Steve, I would start with Steve. So Steve, in a couple of minutes, if you could tell us more about your work in Decathlon, how has this journey been? And um, then we'll move on from there. Sure. Yeah. So, um, well, the journey right from the beginning in Decathlon, uh, yeah, like you said, is uh, 22 years and um, uh, it's gone very, very quickly, like the, the last uh, six, seven years in, in India. You know, uh, fortunately, we had a, a leader in India before me who, who set up um, the business on a B2B model. And uh, we didn't have the license at the time to sell to the final customer. Um, and he instilled with just a few stores a, a really strong DNA, which was to, um, to play differently, to, to try new things and, and not to do, you know, the copy paste from uh, the model in Europe. 
And um, so I arrived um, towards the end of 2013, beginning of, of 14. And um, just at that time, the, the leader of India was nominated to, uh, to, to lead the Decathlon Group worldwide. Uh, and he gave me the brief to, uh, you know, to try to accelerate because we just got the, the B2C license, you know. So it's been a hell of a ride, you know, putting the seatbelt on and uh, up and down on a roller coaster. It's been um, uh, something that I, I couldn't have dreamt about, you know, when I joined Decathlon 22 years ago as a department manager. And it's been, um, you know, a good alignment of the stars because a lot of things came t t together, which I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about t today, you know, about how uh, India is really on the cusp of, uh, you know, kind of developing on many levels in sport. And uh, I think we're in the right place, you know, and um, when you sort of look at um, a city like Mumbai and, and projections in 10 years to have the same GDP as a country like Romania, mm -hmm. then you can understand the, the, the real potential in terms of sport and, and, and sports market, you know, so. Super. A, a, a great journey up, up to now. And uh, like you said, um, you know, I, we're all very passionate about sport. I started which, uh, with, with, with football. It's a bit kind of stereotypical to say an Englishman plays football like a, an Indian plays cricket, you know. And um, uh, but interestingly enough, I was reading the other day that, you know, in the last Olympics, which uh, England did quite well or Britain did quite well, we often do well when, we, when we're sitting down. So cycling, yeah. horse riding and uh, rowing. Uh, a good sport. So uh, football isn't necessarily our strongest. Well, you do well in badminton too these days. I'm, I'm told. I'm better. Yeah. yeah, but it's not, you know, I think the, the cycling has, has taken the nation. We had a Tour de France winner and, uh, you know, in the Olympics, it's, um, yeah. it's become super popular, a big sport. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Steve. Lovely introduction. Talking of sports and potential, now I'll turn to Joy. Joy, uh, cricket, football, now professional volleyball league. Tell us a little bit more about PVL. And an associated question is, how does it work for you to move from one sport to another? What do you look for when you take up these assignments? Interesting. I mean, the one big thing is that one thing I've been convinced about for the longest time is exactly as Steve was saying, that if you want to be anywhere in sport in this world, it's India. Because there are two things. I mean, India is obviously on the hockey stick curve of development, which is anyway bound to happen. But there's one more thing, which is that sport is so, so, so underdeveloped in India that the, you know, the, the ceiling for growth is much, much higher. Because you know, in countries like Australia and all, you have relatively developed sports. That means things can't grow you know, 40%, 50% year on year. But in India, sport is so small. It is so abysmally small, thanks to some terrible administrators over the past 70 years, that there is a huge amount of place to grow. And you know, when I look at sport, I look at it in two ways. One is purely in terms of recreational sport. And that's, it's important for us to understand that there has been a revolution in India in recreational sport, which we don't quite understand. I mean, purely talking, you know, in, in terms of, there's a great story which was told to me by an IS officer who was at that time the Secretary of Sports in India. And he said that, you know, when the new government came in in 2014, he told all secretaries of the government of India, secretary being the senior rank in the Indian Administrative Services, to go back to their villages or their first postings, wherever they were posted first as interns, you know, when they just joined the Indian Administrative Service, and tell them what the changes were. And this gentleman was from Haryana, and he goes back there, and he says that the one thing that I saw out there which has changed was, 25, 30 years ago, when I started my career, it was a banyan tree, which was the center of business in the village. Everything centered around the banyan tree. People would sit under it, they'd smoke their hookahs in the evening. He said, now in Haryana, the center of the village sort of activity was the gym. Mm -hmm. The young men would go in early, they'd exercise, they'd get out. By 10, 10, 30, you know, the sort of senior citizens would come in, they would exercise, they would use the treadmills. And this is happening not just in, you know, villages in Haryana, which is a particularly sports similar place, but also anecdotally, say, in Gurgaon, where three people used to run before downstairs, you will have 30 people running downstairs. And mm. that's why I believe that one, recreational sport is exploding. B is that sport itself is just so small in India that there's, it's going to explode. Yeah. Super, super. What a story. Lovely. So tell me a little bit about PVL. So what is, it's been so, one season already, right? So it's been one season. We've, we've, we've been fighting with the Federation, typically what Federations happen. 
for the second season we what we did was we took volleyball and we put it on its head see one or two or three of the things that happen in this sport is in india one of the things you realize is that professional sport has to work in terms of sponsorship that means television and sponsorship gives you money because cricket in india is not worth anything even something like the ipl the ratio of say the gate to say uh, sponsorship revenue to television revenue is 70 80 to 1 whereas mm-hmm. somewhere if you went to the uk you know manchester united would make 20 25% their money of ticketing or 20% of their money here that would be 4% 3% so what does that mean that means that sports in india has to be a good television product or call it a television or an ott product it has to be a big good on air product for you to watch it right if you look at that there are not too many sports that fulfill that Say mm-hmm. for example, hockey is a terrific sport to watch live. Hockey mm-hmm. is not a great sport to watch on TV because the ball is small, the action is fast. Now you may say that cricket has the same problem. Cricket does not because cricket's thing is cricket is essentially a game of replays. The hot action is five to ten seconds. When the ball is delivered, the guy hits the ball. After that, it's all replays. You're seeing it from six, seven, eight different angles. Right. You can't do that in hockey. you can't even do that in football but fortunately football the ball is big the action is easily visible so one of the things that i when i look at a sport i say what works in terms of a sport mm-hmm. and if a team if a sport does not work as a television sport you cannot show it you cannot have because you will never make the money in india the mm-hmm. second thing to look at on a sport is when you look at it is saying is it a sport money if you want to make a league say a private league individual sports very rarely make successful leagues because uh, there's a great example in the 70s and 80s in america they started something called world team tennis and john mcenroe was playing for los angeles and connors was playing for new york and you know they had all these teams but the problem is when they played against each other it was connors versus bog or mcenroe versus right. connors that you know that she never went on to the thing so whenever i look at a sport to sort of get into i look at two things is it first a television property because if it's not in india you cannot make it go and the second thing very clearly is it a team sport because if i develop an individual sport it may be wonderful action mm. teams will never build loyalty it's mm-hmm. very difficult to you know say a sindhu everyone yeah. watches a saina sindhu match during the badminton league but ask them who sindhu's playing for this year and they'll struggle because yeah, I... because it's very very difficult individual sports the individuals tend to dominate what you see you don't think of which team they play for so when i look at sports those are the two things i look at very seriously for getting into it super i mean i love the perspectives thank you for sharing this uh, very very interesting i love the point about the ball being big i think that's that's a very interesting point and i never thought of it from that perspective so steve the ball's been getting bigger and bigger at decathlon so tell us a little bit about the last few years when growth has been exponential and you even one morning shared with me a very interesting story that people told you not to even expand any more you've done too much or something like that so that's a very very unique thing to hear i have to so, be very careful uh, about what i say to you over coffee uh, that, uh, <laughs> i should not say that here right <laughs> of course okay so let's just delete that part so anyway before i uh, ask you thank you so much the chat is running people please put in your questions uh, the way this runs is that i will ask you to ask the question directly based on the questions you have rather than me try to read it out but please populate the chat there's a q and a please ask questions we'll turn to you very soon Yes, Steve. Tell us about this explosion that you have kind of led. Well, yeah. I mean, um, like I, like I mentioned, um, you know, we we, we came with um, an idea of uh, you know copying probably the, the the model which we'd seen in the UK or in in uh, in France, and and we looked at the market and we looked at a lot of other retailers at the time, like uh, Carrefour, the the French retailer Auchan, uh, even Tesco, and and they're having difficulties to to duplicate, you know, because the potential is there but how to uh, to get the model working so we, we took a call early on to um, you know to change the format of our stores and to really put an emphasis on the infrastructure on the playground and uh, you know and, and we've been super surprised really about the the reaction to the playground because 
in, in most stores, say in the UK or in, in France, the, the, there isn't systematically a playground. There's areas in the store where you can maybe try before you buy, um, but not always systematically a, a place where you can play or get coached or, you know, just, just get into a new sport. And uh, it was probably as early as 2014, we did um, a 10 kilometer run at the, the, the first store in Noida in Delhi NCR. And uh, it was at 6 a.m. And, you know, we, we do that kind of event so early in Europe and you probably get 20 people maximum. Mm -hmm. uh, we did it in Noida and we, we got uh, 600 signed up. And uh, a lot of people are very curious, you know, it was a 10 kilometer run. Some, some were running without shoes, some were, uh, you know, sprinting the first 200 meters like they were going to break the, 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 the world record. <laughs> And uh, it was a mixed bag, you know, and, and, and we realized at that time is that a lot of people are, are, are quite curious about um, trying many things, you know, and we have a lot of events often with partners on the weekend who plug into the, the playground. And uh, we, we feel like, you know, certain, certain events like the photo you, you showed, like uh, the rollerblade is, is a good example. You know, I, I had a McKinsey study in 2014, which uh, said there is no market for rollerblading. And, uh, you know, there's nowhere to practice, you know, the pavements sometimes are not the best quality. So, you know, don't open and, and try uh, rollerblading, you know, but it's, it's one of our fastest growing sports. And uh, every weekend you, you, you see that photo happening is the, probably the one we're, we're the most proud of um, because we're creating the market. You know, we, we feel that 5% of Indians, the classic statistic is 5% of Indians regularly play sport. But we, we've taken it on ourselves to say, okay, how can we create the market, you know, and, and make sport accessible, but not just classic sports, but, you know, if it's carom or skiing or whatever, we, we have the product range. So let's try to get people into those sports too. Fantastic. So creating a culture of sports, I think that's been one of the things that I wanted to talk to you particularly, and of course to Joy, because IPL also changed the way, I mean, we've been crazy about cricket, but IPL changed pretty much every paradigm of cricket or sport for India. So what is your idea? What's the secret sauce? How do we, you know, you know really 5% becomes 50% or we start showing results? And as an outsider, I know that everybody wants to ask that question is that our performance in global sports arena isn't really full of glory. So how does, how do you see your role in that journey from, of inspiration to achievement? It's a really good question. We did actually uh, with um, Annie and my team, uh, was, we were looking at really what is our social business and our social role. And uh, we had um, uh, an external study which um, came, came from France to say, you know, if, if, if it was, I think it was in 2015, they, they said if you, if the Catalan left India now, you know, there would be some economic impact, you, you know, there would be some job losses. Uh, there may be some environmental, you do some good things on the environment, but, uh, you know, maybe no more, no less than, um, than others. But in, on a social level, you'll be really missed, you know, and, um, you, you know, and, and it, it is through this factor of the playground. So we took it a bit further. We started to do a, a few immersions in um, different villages across the country. Mm -hmm. You know, what is our role here, you know, and... and uh, the first few days we said, well, okay, you know, maybe the primary needs of people isn't sport and, uh, you know, it's maybe employment and uh, eating, you know, and, and, and getting a good wage and what have you. But then we realized, you know, that um, uh, a lot of the kids um, were, were practicing sport and they were doing quite well and, and were actually performing really well. But at the age of 12, 13, it sort of tailed off a little bit, mm. particularly amongst the, you know, the girls, you know, and it was quite, you know, emotional moment at some stage where, you know, you see a young girl, you know, because we, 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 we had a group at 12 years old and then we, we had a group at 16. Mm -hmm. And there was a group at 16, uh, you know, the girl was saying, I used to love playing sport with my brothers, but then I got told, you know, that that's, uh, that studies is more important or, you know, you got to help around the house or what have you, you know. So there was that kind of drop off. Mm. And, uh, we said, well, yeah, there is potentially something we can do here, you know, and we, we have some kind of social business model we can work on as well. Okay. Let me turn that question around to Joy. Uh, of course, I will go back to the IPL to start with, and of course, then come further forward. So again, yes, people have talked about how IPL has changed the landscape of professional sports in India. So how did it happen? What worked? 
And if I, if the second part of that question would be that if you go back and think back of your two early seasons there, and of course, I don't know how many seasons has it been, 10, 10 odd seasons now? 12. Yeah, 12 seasons. So how has the, how has the momentum sustained and what's the future? So two things. One is that, you know, and I'm being very candid here. I know that the kind of audience I'm speaking to is, <laughs> will, will appreciate me being straight. But if you look at the person who did this, the man, Lalit Modi, I mean, he's a prime mover behind it. And to do something really different, you need a disruptor. And Lalit Modi is your classic disruptor. I mean, he was, and remember something, he's not had a lot of success before this. He's tried to get into the BCCI before this. Dalmia has kept him out. He had a partnership. In fact, ESPN and Modi, the, they had a partnership together, Disney and Modi. And that partnership fell apart, which is why Disney took five more years to come into India. Mm -hmm. So he's this young scion of a big business family who's tried his hand at everything. And none of it has worked so far. Okay. But what does he have? He has that connect with understanding what a top class product is. And he, what he does is he gets together his friends. So what does he have that nobody else has? He's corporate. So he understands, okay, here's what corporates want to do. This is what big business wants to do. So he understands that, okay, sponsorship is important. I need to get a professional firm like IMG in. He understands that in India to do well, you need that, what we call that great intersection between what we call politics, sports and films, which is, which are our three sort of magic, you know, things. And he's got them together. And he has a social context to meet a Jay Mehta and say, why don't you and Shah Rukh take a team or to a Mukesh Ambani or to all these people. And look, he gets to these all guys all together. And then what happens? First match, it could have gone either way. And I remember, I think a day later, Delhi played uh, Jaipur, okay? and uh, Rajasthan and it was like Rajasthan got 120 odd and Delhi knocked, rolled it over EC and like if that had been the first match of IPL also maybe the IPL wouldn't have had to start it did. <laughs> and here is Brendan McCullum goes berserk the stadium is a Chinna Swami which is a you know balls fly in that stadium anyway because you're at altitude you know, it's two and a half three thousand feet so all these elements come get together and create this incredible big bang and the truth of it is nobody could have planned it that way. I mean, he, you can't plan for Brendan McCullum to go berserk there. But everything just went right. And therefore, what happened is it started at such a level that after that, it just didn't. The other interesting thing is if you look at IPL over the first few years, it's very interesting. I remember a lot of cricketers who came in in year one thought this is a bit of a hit and a giggle. Even senior cricketers, top South African cricketers, they'd say, oh, yeah, we'd party in the evening. So what if we win or if we lose? And I'm telling you, there are teams who have lost because players, you know, first year it's about partying and this thing. So the game is still not that important. But see, these guys are all professional sports people. So year two now, suddenly they've lost. It's hurt and they said, no, wait a minute. This is serious mm -hmm. sport. Mm -hmm. So if you now go back to the IPL over the years, the way the IPL has played, the way the tactics has changed, the, what we call the arms race of technology, you know, batsman versus bowlers. Does the wide yorker work? Does this work? This arms race has gone higher and higher. So forget about it. Now, today, the stars are hanging on to the IPL by its coattails. Right. It's, yes. a, it's a game that's now drawing the stars rather than the other way around. It's like the Premier League now, where you want to invest in the Premier League because it's a thing to do to get associated with. And that's what's happened to the IPL. They, they managed to take the stars it managed to make that concoction that really worked. And now you've got the reverse position where the IPL now takes the rest of it with it then, you know. And it's just, as I said, would it have happened differently? Could they have done anything different? No, they couldn't have even planned making it so big. So much of it was just the right place at the right time. And remember, Lalit, after that, has done not done anything of note. Mm -hmm. Before that, he hasn't done anything of note. But that one thing that he did right, has changed Indian sport forever. And it's not just cricket, it's changed Indian sport forever. That's pretty much it. It has changed Indian sport. But let me then follow up with a question. Two, or, two of the major factors that you mentioned, one is serendipity, the other is a, a, one guy who had the vision and also, also the contacts. Now that's not really, you know, recipe for a system. How does one replicate that for a kabaddi or a badminton or something? 
You can't get such guys and base it on luck. No, you can't. You can't see there are two, three things again. To expect anything else will work like the IPL is, I think, stupid. And that's one of the biggest problems that we are having today with leagues. The other thing is leagues are pricing people on a different level. They're saying if, say, a badminton star, a top Indian badminton star deserves at least one third that of an IPL player. Good business doesn't work that way. Mm. The question is, if this is the amount of money a badminton league earns, this is the amount of money I can pay the player. Mm. Because if you have that out of whack and then you hope that this equation will change, it's not going to change that easily. So that's one of the things. And which is why you see the, one of the stupidest things is everyone now wants stars to come in and have sweat equity and get that. And <laughs> there's a very funny thing. I mean, I shouldn't be talking about it, but one of the examples is the ISL. And there's a lot of things the ISL has done right. And there's a lot of places where they're in the right place. But the second year of ISL, they had a picture of the ISL. So this is the Indian Super League football. I won't call it soccer because that's an insult to anyone outside America. Nice. So Indian Football League, you have a picture out there with Nita Ambani takes. And in that picture are all the people because the Indian Football League is launched. There's uh, MS Dhoni. There's Virat Kohli. There's Abhishek Bachchan. There's Ranbir Kapoor. Okay, <laughs> Galaxy, film stars, cricketers. There wasn't a bloody footballer. There was not one bloody footballer. Okay, it's a famous picture. And I said, are you are trying to develop football without a footballer. Your one picture that's going to be on every headline tomorrow. Your one picture that's going to be in every newspaper tomorrow doesn't have a footballer. Wait, they do it again the next year. So go back and see the selfie taken after ISL, before ISL 3. It's the same thing. There isn't a footballer out there. Mm -hmm. And so here's my problem. My problem is that if the things around sport, if the surround is bigger than the sport, you're never going to have a successful sport. The IPL is successful so far because the level of cricket now is outstanding. It's the best cricket in the world. It's played at a very high level, very competitively. You take that away and you try and do the celebrity film cricket league. Nobody watches it. Mm. Films are playing. So get it. Respect that the sport is the single important thing. That is the essence. That's the sauce. The sauce, everything else is a garnish sauce. Okay. Okay. I think that is really hitting it out of the park. Yeah. I feel fine. Thank you for saying that. Let me, let me turn to Steve Dykes now. I'm going to turn this a little bit because uh, I, I, have, I will take about five more minutes and then we turn this over to questions and some fantastic questions are already coming in into the chat. Keep them coming, folks. We can address as many as possible. So, Steve, you've been running a pretty large show, 5,000 odd people. And then this lockdown happened. I'm totally changing gear here. How did you keep your employees engaged in this absolute insane period where everything shut down? Because my, my memory of your store is it's full of energy. People are running around, the staff is on their toes. And then suddenly that bunch of energetic people, boom, it's gone. Yeah. And they're sitting at home, many of them young people. How did you manage to keep your flock together? Yeah, it's uh, it, at the beginning. I mean, uh, nobody's ready for a moment like this, you know, and it, it sort of happened so quickly. You know, I think we all remember beginning of March, uh, you know, we were just outside here having a coffee with the team talking about, uh, you know, COVID going to uh, at that stage. It wasn't COVID. It was Corona going to uh, Europe. And, and um, we were all kind of in this kind of, uh, you know, kind of bubble of saying, but yeah, we're carrying on as business as usual, you know, and then the next week we, we pretty much went to uh, lockdown, you know, and so I think it's um, it's often in these situations that you, yeah nobody has the answer, so you, you you're like building the bridge as you cross the river, um, and the most important thing to do is um, is to jump in the pool, you know, not look at the water, you know, you have to try a lot of things to keep uh, people engaged, you know, and fortunately I've got a good team, uh, people who work in the in the different departments were very keen to try a, a lot of new things. Um, very quickly. So we decided to keep busy. Uh, you know, my, my kind of leadership style, which is probably mirroring the, you know, the movement of uh, leadership in Decathlon uh, normally is, you know, it, it doesn't fit in with your title. It's more leading from the back instead of leading from the front. It doesn't mean I'm, you know, lazy and, and sitting on the couch or anything, but, it, you know, we used to have an image in Decathlon when I joined, which was more 
you know, a, a peloton of cyclists and you had to pick which one you were in that group, you know, and um, in the, you know, the early days, it was better to be the yellow jersey leading everybody forward, you know, and at the front. Recently, we, we, you know, in the last uh, eight years, we've, we've changed tack a little bit and now we have a picture of uh, a wolf pack. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, there's the young people with a lot of energy trying things at the front and hunting for food and, you know, maybe the stable ones in the middle looking after things. And then, you know, the leader at the back just keeping an eye and, and impulsing and what have you. But I realized during this COVID period, you know, just to, you know, be at the back is not the right um, strategy. Um, and a little bit like uh, Queen Elizabeth says, you know, in England is you have to be seen to be believed. Yes. And, uh, you know, and, and sort of um, I took it on myself to be, you know, be as visible as possible. Uh, we, we did a lot of things, you know, um, just to liberate the energy, because like you said, the Catalan store are full of young people with a lot of energy, you know. So we said, you know, uh, all the textbooks say at the moment um, in this kind of period of crisis that um, you can be very fragile. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a writer, Taleb, who's a hedge fund manager, who, who talked about the anti-fragility. He couldn't find a word which was op opposite uh, to fragile. He, 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 at first, he talked about robust, but he said, no, robust is not really hitting the mark. Um, we have to develop uh, anti-fragility. And what he meant was, in a crisis, you have to take advantage and you have to get stronger mm -hmm. during uh, a period where you could be considered as fragile. And, and Decathlon is fragile in a period like this because we have physical stores and they were all closed. We, uh, we launched a lot of challenges and tried to liberate the energy uh, with a lot of people to say, okay, find a, a minimum eight new ways of selling which are not involving the store. And we, we did a kind of a sprint mode and, and you know, the reaction has just been crazy. You know? mm -hmm. and, and just recently we We've seen that, you know, just like the Tupperware ladies, we have uh, teammates selling in the networks <laughs> and we've, they've sold uh, three to four core already, you know, and we've got uh, drive through concepts or the zero contact. Uh, we're, we're looking at, um, you know, selling on uh, phone platforms. We're looking at affiliation with sport partners, you know, because normally they were uh, doing coaching on our playgrounds and, uh, you know, that stopped and their source of income stopped. But we said, okay, if you can be an influencer on Instagram and, and obviously sell our products and, and, and get some kind of commission, mm -hmm. um, how can it go? So, you know, we have ideas from membership and it's just been, a, in, in a sense, all these things that we used to write in the vision and, and say, yeah, one day we will do. Uh, this COVID has given us a, a constraint to say, instead of we will do, we do, you know, and, and um, it, it's been an opportunity in many ways. Yeah. May you live in interesting times. Mm -hmm. Isn't it's a very interesting uh, new thing these days. Yes, so yes. I have one more question and then uh, that's to Joy. And then I will open up because my chat box is pinging with questions and they're all good. So I'll have a tough time choosing. So Joy, and I'm turning this to you. And this is, I won't call it contentious, but it's something that people have pinged me in the last few days when ever since they heard that you are going to be here. And this links back to the conversation of culture that Steve just kind of started. Uh, we are all talking of building cultures which are inclusive, and you know, DNI, inclusion, and diversity are stuff that we are talking about all the time. And we are right in the middle of the Black Lives Matter movement. BLM is hitting us hard, and of course, you know how suddenly the IPL has been singed by it, by a cricketer talking about a team and his teammates. So, have you experienced in your stints in not just IPL but in professional sports management and in teams, and because? I know in professional football leagues, it's rampant. In cricket, we have had some scandals. And what has been the best way of dealing with these, if there is any management lesson that we can take out of this? I think two things. One is, interestingly enough, you know, as I said, what was said was inappropriate, stupid, and culturally wrong. And if anyone takes, some, you know, takes it as something that you say endearingly, it doesn't matter. It depends on what the person listening thinks. If he doesn't think that's suitable, you're not using it, no matter what your interpretation of it is, whether it's suitable or not. Yeah. So that's very clear. I'm very clear on that. See, I'll tell you, to be honest with you, uh, sport is an interesting thing within sports teams generally. Okay. And it's very interesting. There's not too much racism. And right. you know why? It's because people are really focused on ability. So what they will really admire is shit. Did you see the way he hits that hook? You know, can you see the way he pulls? They are very ability-focused. Top-level sports persons are absolutely focused on ability. So they, 
they're not really seeing whether you're Hindu or Muslim or Christian. They don't really care whether you're white or black. They are focused on what do you do with the ball? Can you do something differently? Can you teach me how to bowl a different ball? And that's the one thing. So generally, the, the actual, while they're playing, they're not thinking about whether he's black, white, yellow, pink. Doesn't matter to them. Well, what does happen though is you are getting a melting bag of a lot of cricketers from very different diverse backgrounds. Some of them are educated, some of them understand these things, some of them don't. So you are going to have issues like this, these sort of casual racism, what I call. Right. And it happens and the only way to do it is if it happens in front of you, call it out. Mm. Okay? But fundamentally when they're on the field, by and large, I mean, I have not seen anything, anyone saying that, oh, he's a black man, so he's it's the reverse. Have you seen him hit the shot? So the conversation in professional sport is about what you do with the ball, not about how you look. So that's the one thing that I have to say. Having said that, as I said, the only thing you can do is just the people who use stuff like this or people who do casual racism, call them out, call them out immediately, call them out quickly and say it's wrong. I mean, I'll give you a very good example. I mean, uh, about... 20 years back, 15, 17 years back, I used to work at ESPN Star Sports. And I realized one of the things I used to do while talking to somebody, if they, you know, young intern, these girls say, sweetheart, you know, try it this way. And today I realize it is completely inappropriate. You do not call somebody sweetheart. In, in my, my point is that in, in those days I heard it, I thought it didn't seem to be something particularly insulting. Nobody particularly reacted to it. That doesn't mean it was right. Right. I wish somebody had told me, I wish I had known that it was not appropriate then. But we do these things casually. We are casually sexist or casually racist and we are learning all the time. The only thing you can really do about it is turn down, build a culture where people have the courage to say, you know what, I said that before and it's not appropriate. I'm sorry, I won't say it again because I know now that it's not appropriate. You have to build a culture of that instead of having a culture of being defensive. No, but what I said was not wrong. Dude, what you said was wrong. Absolutely. What you said was wrong, but I shouldn't pin you down in, in a way that makes you so defensive about it that then you explodes into anger in the system. Understand that what you've said, all of us are casually sexist, racist in some way or the other. Accept it when we are and get the, get moving, get moving, get on with it. That's all I have to say. Thank you for your candor. I think that's, that's a fantastic anecdote also. I think all of us have kind of fallen for those, you know, missteps. Steve, one last question to you before I turn to my audience. Yeah. Upholding a culture that's generationally diverse, national, it has, it's a multinational culture, different regions, people coming in. And of course, your background in, let's say, in sports back in Europe, where again, racism is something that's often talked about on the field and off the field your thoughts about your experiences and how to deal with this best. I think Joey has really got a, a good point. And, um, you know, we're, we're often uh, yeah, seeing things which, uh, you, you know, are completely out of order. And I think it's better not to, uh, to, to, to be quiet about it, you know, and, and to, you know, really uh, debrief and talk about it. You know, if you, if you do see it in the workplace or, you know, you, you, you see it on the, uh, the playing field, you know, and, I mean, culturally, um, you know, I noticed a massive difference, uh, you know, even when I arrived, uh, obviously in India, you know, and uh, the way, you know, it, it seemed at the beginning, everything was, was completely different, you know, and, and so there, there are obviously differences between different cultures, but it can't go to the point of uh, being uh, insulting or, you know, excluding, you know, and you know, I, I see the, the European culture are very, in business terms, you know, kind of um, a little bit like steel, you know, uh, things are straight the roads are straight the meetings have all got this uh, clear agenda you know and, and people go to clash you know and in india at the beginning it, it felt you know things were flowing you know the the road is blocked and we'll do a u-turn and we'll go on on the other side you know and <laughs> so there's always culturally you know real differences about how, how people approach work and, and do business and what have you and i think it's always adaptation you know what i say to a you know, the, the 11 uh, or so kind of expats who are here, you know, amongst the, the, the 5,000 is, you know, when, when I was in um, UK and, and working for a French company, uh, I speak French, you know, and it was often in meetings, um, you know, in French, the guys were saying, oh, les anglais, les anglais, and it was really always the fault of the English, you know, because <laughs> they were French. Right. And I said, you know, if you come over here now, you're Indian. 
you know, you can't say it's the Indians do this, the Indians do that. You, you know, you have to be Indian. I'm an Indian, you know, and, and I think we have to adapt. Everybody has to adapt to, uh, to cultures and, and not group people into, you know, stereotypes, you know, and, and if you feel people are doing that and it's on the verge of like what uh, Joy said of being, you know, offensive, insulting, you have to, you have to speak up. All the time. So, yeah. Well, we have been blam blaming the Brits too, trust me. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now enough from me. Now I'm going to turn this around. So the way we are going to do this is I am going to, again, because beautiful questions, but some of them are extremely wordy and I am not very good at paraphrasing. So let me start by, so I'm just going to unmute the person who's asked the question. I may not be able to deal with all the questions. The first one, is coming from Raj Basu, who's my friend from ITC. Raj, uh, over to you. You have a question for Joy. Hi, Joy. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Lovely. Hi, Raj. Hi, hi, hi. Lovely. Love having the discussion. It was awesome. So my question is, um, you know, we've had some great commercial success and we've had a few Olympic spikes, if I might say. Uh, how can we marry the two? We want to be better at Olympics. We want to be better at athletics and all the, you know, uh, all the bouquet of games. At the same time, we want commercial success. And uh, do they have to be married in order for our Olympic capability at the, the moments to improve? Or uh, is that a wrong, uh, you know, line of thinking? Look, mm, let's, let's be honest. I mean, if I, if I was to turn around today and say that, you know, should we go after Olympic medals? And there's a, there's a template out here. Two people who have done that very successfully as countries. One is East Germany. Given their size, the kind of medals they'd win was ridiculous. Okay? And the second is uh, Great Britain since the 2008 Olympics. They've taken particular sports and really focused on it. But remember one thing. That's clearly to get Olympic glory. Because you're not going to make kayaking a commercial sport. It's not going to make money that way. Cycling still might. Kayaking is not going to. So what happens is if you want commercial, if you want Olympic success, what a lot of countries do is focus on small sports where there's not too much competition, throw money at it, throw things at it, and try and get success. And it's not that India is not trying. A lot of countries are trying to do this. And it's, uh, it's about how much resources you throw and what you can do. That you can't you don't, just because you've thrown so much money on archery doesn't mean that an archery league is viable at this point in time. So these are two very different things. And therefore, what you've got to look at is saying that there is one part of it which people who are going to put money into, whether it's a government, whether it's a state government or people like OGQ, GoSport, there's one point where people are going to put money behind it with no expectation of anything other than the fact that, you know, they're going to get some Olympic medals out of it or some Olympic glory out of it. But you cannot expect a commercial return from that part of the business. Finally, the kind of sport that you're going to expect a return from, India might be 60th ranked, 100th ranked in football, but you have a far better chance of recovering money from football as a sport if you invest in it than you have of, say, recovering it from shooting. So that's the only point, that medals are a very, very different game. And I think a lot of countries game them well. We haven't managed to game them well. That's not to say we want in the future as well. We, and we are better at it than we were, say, 10 years back. I mean, really, from then, we've moved on a bit. From Bindra onwards, we've at least started to get some, some way in, 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 into understanding how to game that system works. But mm -hmm. uh, don't, I, I, I think it's very difficult to marry these two things that we're talking about. Very, very true. Uh, you know, I... Um... I, I, in, I was fortunate enough to be in London during the Olympics and uh, being a French company, we, we, we met up with the French Olympic team and uh, three gold medalist kayak. He said, you know, I, I'm very famous every four years and then uh, I can live my life uh, very quietly uh, and nobody recognizes me in between, you know, and, uh, you know, so it's just really not a commercial sport afterwards, you know. Fantastic. Thank you so much for these answers. I'm going to turn to Biren. Biren, you had a question first for Steve. Biren, you're on. Uh, hi, Steve. Good to see you virtually. Um, uh, you know, I think uh, you talked about uh, you know how you've been aligning the stars and and everything like that is big in India. For non-sporting folks, uh, I think decathlon has managed to 
you know, be the place where they have low hanging fruit uh, to, ex and you've been trying to expand the market. You talked about roller blades, for example. And so I think you're looking at broadening the category where people don't necessarily play active sports, right? Yeah. So uh, just to uh, twist my tongue a bit, how do you make things inspirational for those who are averse to things perspirational and make it aspirational? <laughs> Very good. Very great uh, question. <laughs> Words smithy again. Oh, Viren, fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's true. I, you know, we, we, we deliberately tried to position ourselves. We had a look at the, the marketing um, uh, going on, really, uh, you know, from all the, the leading players, uh, uh, you know, and the images, it, you know, you see, um, you know, slogans, impossible is nothing and what have you, and, and, and the guys and the girls are, are looking so good and uh, everything is so perfect. And, we said, you know, it's not decathlon, you know, and, and I don't look like that. And, uh, you know, and, and sometimes I fall over and I, I can't play this sport, you know, and, and it's uh, really more entry level. So we've tried to kind of alter our tone of voice uh, to really be, you know, not taking ourselves too seriously, you know, and, and to really, you know, say, you know, we want to make sports accessible to the many in India. Uh, so it, it's not like we're f forbidding the elite athlete to come into the store, but we, you, you know, we, we feel at the top of the pyramid or at the, the elite level, we're, we're not really catering to that. We're, we're really trying to make sport accessible to the bottom of the pyramid and the regular and the beginner, you know, and it's, it's primarily the family, you know, we try to do our communication with, you know, to say, um, you know, it, it won't break the bank, you, you look good try trekking or try camping or whatever you, you know, and we, we, we've really positioned ourselves there. And at that kind of level of the market, you know, to open up all of these sports, some of these sports, they don't have a big margin, like, um, you know, the, the shoes and the textile, that's where you, you can really make your money in retail. Mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're not really the fashion. We're saying, okay, it's uh, to try this sport. So that's why we never really get involved in sponsorship. You know, if we sponsored Lionel Messi, we'd have to put up our prices and we'd have to, cut the number of sports, you know, yeah. and, and uh, you know, so it's, I think every retailer takes that kind of uh, position and that stance, you know, and we've decided to kind of open up the market and not take ourselves too seriously, you know, to, to, uh, to encourage people to try before they buy, but you, you, you know, it's more like with people who, you know, have never tried, uh, you know, Pilates or what have you, it's not necessarily the elite we're going after. Fantastic. Thanks. Thank you for that answer, Steve. I keep telling people that, you know, in India, shopping is a sport, but decathlon has made uh, the, the sport become a place that you, you know, shop for. So congratulations on that. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Viren. Thank you, Steve. Lovely answer. So I'm going to turn to, okay, I've got a lot of questions. And just for everybody's information, today we are extending this to 645. So keep asking, because with the permission of everyone, we are going on till 645. But I, I'm going to turn this because there's a finance angle that's been brought in by my friend Raghuram Krishnan. Raghu, you're on. Okay, thank you. So always difficult to follow Biren, you know, his words. <laughs> I, I get a little psyched after that. So wonderful hearing both of you. Uh, this has become like our Friday evening family time. All of us sit in here to, you know, the webinars that happen. So fantastic. My question was around, you know, the sporting events itself thrive on business sponsoring them. And around COVID, they're all going through, you know, financial crisis, uh, cash being a significant issue, right, where sponsorship comes into play. How is sports going to sustain itself over the course of uh, the next year or 18 months until the vaccine comes out, right? Uh, only after that, we will see people coming back into watching the sport live. How do you think the sports will manage? Because it is expensive especially if you look at soccer, cricket, you know, there's a huge money around that. So who are you asking this question to? Uh, I would start with Joy uh, because he's associated with the sports directly and then probably Steve can chime in. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Agu. Uh, obviously, interesting question and something that we are all pondering. The very funny thing that's uh, happening, especially with what's happening now in the world of sport is after every major calamity, you know, when sport returned, it actually returned first at the bottom level. So say after the war in the UK, you started with the village games and the clubs game, then the test matches started happening. It was over that. Okay. Similarly, after the first world war, here's the interesting thing in when sport comes back now, only the big sport will be able to afford to return first. 
because the kind of hygiene, the kind of things that you need to do to put things together is only an IPL or a big tournament like that is capable of doing it. So it's interesting. You're going to actually see those big events. The NBA happened first. La Liga happened first. The IPL happened first because they can afford to take the kind of measures that smaller and medium sports can't afford to do. So the fact of the matter is the middle of the pyramid is going to be really badly hit for the next year or so because simply some leagues just will not, it will no longer be economically viable to hold a league if they have to take the kind of, uh, uh, they have to kind of, they have to take the kind of securities, not security, their safety measures that they have to under these circumstances. So that's going to be the big blowout here and there's, there's really very little anyone can do about it. Add to that the double whammy of the fact that there's not enough cash in the market and uh, sport is like that. Sport is in India is not looked on as a necessity. It's like an add-on, you know. Once we've sort of bread and butter is looked after, it's not even the jam. It's like after the jam, it's a marmalade probably, mm. you know. And that's my point. That So we are going to be very, very badly hit. And, uh, you know, it's there's no point getting away from that. The fact of the matter is the only thing we've got to look at it is that our essentials, the basics of Indian sport is very good because, as I said, there's a huge opportunity for advancement. We are finally getting our act together in terms of, you know, organizations that are into sport. And among younger people today, there is a culture of sport which was completely missing even, say, 5, 10, 15, 20 years back. So we can only hope that that overall level as we slowly improve, things improve. But in the short term, it's a big business that will return much before the medium and small businesses return. And that's the reality of it. Super. I think that's a great point. We are working right now on a couple of design challenges, hackathons with organizations in Europe trying to do exactly that. How do we get people to trust the stadium again to come back from sports people to the audiences? And I think this is, I've heard, I mean, there are two, three other questions exactly that talks of sports in the post-COVID world. So thank you for putting it across so nicely. Steve, would you like to add anything to uh, Joy's perspective there? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, because we're, we're again at the, the grassroots level, um, we, we did a lot of things, uh, you know, physically before, you know, and we have a lot of partners. We, we launched a, a platform, uh, you know, just at the beginning of the year, all for sport, where, you know, partners could plug in and, and uh, you know, book uh, the playgrounds and give coaching lessons, you know, and, and, and um, was working super well. We just, uh, you know, did it in uh, Bangalore and already a hundred partners had plugged in, um, you know, and, and, and so, you know, we, we've seen that dramatic move towards virtual, you know, so they've carried on uh, doing a lot of things and, and coaching and what have you and, and finding ways to do it uh, online. And we're sort of wondering, will, will people come back and when will they come back to uh, mm. the physical world, you know? And, and um, so I suppose that's one, one thing we're, we're, we're getting ready with. Fortunately, we do have, uh, you know, this platform where, you know, even this evening at seven o'clock, I'll be patching in because um, we have, a, you know, a famous nutritionist, uh, you know, giving advice about sports injury and, and nutrition. And we're, we're getting such a, a take up, you know, already, you know, 100, 150 people signing up to, you know, very interested about that topic. Mm -hmm. Whereas before it would be a talk in the store, you know, and, and uh, it would be in a physical way, you know, so... We're thinking in, in some ways, you know, we, we did, you know, maybe eight, nine percent of our business online before. And, and uh, we're, we're saying, OK, we, we probably, you know, in this turbulent Tokyo period, you know, open a few less stores. We, you know, we were due to open 15 this year. It was our record year. And we'll probably still open six. Um, and we're kind of pivoting to, uh, to say, OK, but maybe, um, you know, for this anti-fragility, we, we, we really need to, um, you know, tap into the fact that people maybe do want to have, uh, you know, the service at home and in a virtual way. And we have to create value around the product, which is in a digital way. You know. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a big one in the sense, certain that if you take the tactile elements out of these experiences, it's going to be a complete reinvention. And I don't think that any of us have any answers yet. No. Uh, my, I'm going to open this for Abhishek Chakrabarti. Are you here? I see your question. Abhishek, you can ask your question, please. Thank you, Raghu. Abhishek, are you here? Hey, hi. Uh, hi, everyone. Hi, Steve. Hi, Joy. Uh, very interesting session. And being a sports lover, it's been an added cherry on the cake. Uh, 
so i wanted to ask a question to steve so when you are talking about like what the kind of social impact that decathlon is having so we have really seen how the whole concept of health and fitness has changed with the presence of decathlon in urban cities but how how do you want to like what would be your strategy to take it to the tier 2 and tier 3 cities where availability of equipment or sports facilities are not that great as an urban city but most of our sports talents usually come from these cities yeah so is there any strategy that you are envisioning on taking your impress yes. into the interland thank you yes it's it's a uh, right on the target you know and and uh, the first phase you know like linked to what i said at the beginning with you know that uh, you know places like mumbai will have the gdp of romania in not so long you know so we've really focused in our first phase on uh, tier 1 you know and and um uh of the, the you know the 13 to 15 stores were opening this year half of them were tier 2 so i'm presently in a kind of discussion with with my board members at the moment because they said well you know sometimes in tier 2 places uh, it's a longer return of investment you know you have to be very patient as opposed to opening in a, a place like mumbai where the return of investment is 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 quite quick so we we still are opening a tier 2 we we did a a wave of tier 2 in in um 2015 and they were too big and too much money was put out too much cash and it was very slow for the return we now have a model which we feel is a lot better and and we've actually tried to send a couple of tier, teammates to uh, certain cities in india which are class tier 2 to tier 3 uh, to actually uh, make connections and and invest in sport before the store because the the big money investment is the store and uh, that with the physical retail under pressure from you know the likes of amazon and what have you you know we have to be careful not to be overextended with too many bricks and and not enough clicks you know and uh, you know so we're we're actually still interested to to unlock the tier 2 and we we think maybe virtually and uh, sending teammates who who are from the cities is one way to create connections to see if there is a potential market uh to do some you know b2b deals and 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 then to see if we can build the store afterwards so um you know before covid we were full steam ahead to open a lot of tier 2 stores we've just reined it back a little bit at the moment just because it's so turbulent and uh, we we want to see what happens with things like the exchange rate etc okay lovely thank you so much okay any more questions coming in vishal kapoor yes hold on vishal let me find you on this list Vishal, go ahead, please. And who would you ask this to? Vishal, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me, Anil? Sorry. Yes, Vishal. Who is this addressed to? Uh, this is to Steve from one yeah. retailer to another. Yes. Yeah. So, since he mentioned about, uh, firstly, I think a great talk from both of you, and. Uh, it's wonderful to see i i did comment on that so i want to elaborate on that but something which steve you're trying to connect with everybody at a very ubiquitous kind of a level you know making sports a everyday talk uh, and then uh, joy you come in and pick up the great uh, jewels from there hopefully for future so there is a sort of a uh, pyramidical effect which i see with both of you uh, you know contributing uh, individually uh my question is a little more uh, business oriented so in the roi specific uh, steve you said that in tier 2 or 3 your roi is always less yeah. uh, in our case uh, in a very peculiar way if i talk about a big bazaar or any such value format stores we've always been better uh, in the tier 2s yeah uh, because of the low rent and because of the low capital uh, you know the operating expenses yeah uh, mumbai just takes it away from us yeah and i, I think uh, Yeah, the mistakes we made in 2015 was we um because it was a lot cheaper we we said okay let's um you know do big stores and uh, because the land is cheap or what have you you know and, and we realized that we 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 probably added too many square feet or too many meter squared mm. you know? so the new model which we presented last year was uh, to always go in an existing building so we you know we're not building the store because 50% of our stores we we build ourselves Sure. Uh, and have the big playground and what have you and and 50%. So if you take a you know a, a city like uh, Bhubaneswar you know we have a 2000 square meter store with a playground and uh, it's now uh, reaching a moment of return of investment but it's um, it's a slow one you know so we mm-hmm. we said now let's look at it more maybe existing uh, buildings less square meters 
Um, but still to have the playground because we want to still have that kind of infrastructure where, you know, coaches can come and, and people can try before they buy and then, uh, you know, do coaching. If we do. So it's probably right. more of a change of the business model and learning as we go along. Um, you know, what, what um, you know, the, the, the adequate size of store should be. Already in India, we're, we're half the size of store um, compared to Europe. The average size store is about 40,000 square feet, 4,000 square meters in Europe, and we're about 2,000 um, in India. So we've, we've, we've adapted when we came, and, and you know, the number of models also is, uh, you know, over 12,000 models in, in Europe, and we have about 4,000 in India, you know. So mm -hmm. trying to make those available online and, and be very careful with the, the number of square meters. Great, okay. great, great. Thank, Thank you, you, Vishal. Thank you. Thank you. My next uh, question is coming from Parag Agarwal. Parag, you're on to Joy. Uh, yeah, hello. Hi, Joy, sir. Uh, my name is Parag. I'm one of your older students from Mike, and I work in Decathlon. Uh, so my question is that, you know, as Decathlon is trying to introduce sports like Pilates, skating in India, and now people are more aware about these sports, how do you think we can give it a platform, like an infrastructure to scale it up for India to be a more diverse sporting country and sort of, you know, help uh, represent all these sports in the Olympics? Like, do you think government will spend on it or uh, we will get some platform to scale it up? See, there are two, three things. One is that, uh, thanks for the question, Parag. A pleasure having taught at MICA. Still enjoy myself there. Quick, uh, the quick answer is two things. One is that, look, you know, first, of, one of the great things that's happened over the last three, four, five years is, you know, the OTT platforms and YouTube and what you can do and technology become much, much, much more cheaper. So my point is that you don't necessarily now need to do these huge whiz bang competitions with crores of rupees. Think small, think of small areas, think of small places where you're doing various activities. It doesn't need to be just remember, you know, it's a, it's a funny thing. You know, I had an Australian friend who used to come to India and he used to say, look, all of Australia is just about South Bombay. That's about, you know, in, in relative terms, or it's a bit, bit more than South Bombay. All, no, all of New Zealand is South Bombay. All of Australia is just about, you know, all of Bombay, you know, it's literally like that. So you can do very targeted, small activities at various places, which are uh, value for money, which work and which you can popularize as well. Go local, go nimble, start with small things. Don't try and make this national Pilate league, which is so big. And let me get three actresses into it. Let me do yoga. No, I don't need to do it, dude. I can do a really small one in Bangalore saying, okay, this white field, this locality, I can do a contest here. It's very nimble. It's small. It's a model that I can replicate, create small, agile, nimble models. Every sport has a sort of size that it can sort of absorb. And if you are saying that, you know, I'm starting with sports that are not so popular, make them small and make them in a position where you can reach economy very fast. And that's what I would look at. The great part of what the internet offers us today is what we call the long tail. So, you know, it doesn't matter. On a, you can go, you don't need to be on Sony or Star. You can be on Facebook Live. And uh, there's a great example of that is say, for example, this Ironman marathon. You know, it's an activity that goes on and on. It's 18 hours. And it's impossible to be a television product because it's too long, too few people watch it. But for those 30,000 people in the world, or into Iron Man, it is an amazing thing. So it's a perfect product for that long tail. And I'm saying that what you need to do is address the long tail, find places where you can get these people together and just make sure that you don't spend too much money. And whenever you have something, when you have a base of people, keep tweaking that model, keep moving it from city to city, keep adding small, small cells rather than one big, you know, Soviet style monolith. And that's what I do with these businesses. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Joy. Sorry, uh, I'm just, I mean, I, I know yeah. Steve would have figured this out much before I had, but. No, it's exactly the, the right. Uh, I think that the, 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 the point is, you know, um, dream big, but start small. You know, and I think it's exactly that, you know, because a lot of people dream big and start big and then it loses a lot of money, you know. So. Exactly. Exactly. I think that's a great point you made, Joy. So I am, I'm, I'm, I'm cognizant of the time. We have about five. So I have a question. I mean, I'm going to just jump the queue Indian style and ask the question to Joy. Um, so Joy, uh, 
and this is a question I know one of my audience members actually asked me earlier. What has changed about your journey? Uh, and because I want to bring it back to you, the leader, uh, because it's been a lot of telling the world, but it's more now let's bring it back to you. Uh, from head of programming at ESPN Star and then uh, National Geographic, to now leading these professional leagues, bringing a tournament to India. What, what do you see changing in your style of management and your style of leadership? Interesting. It's very interesting because I am not, I'm not cut out to be what is the, what we call the traditional, very 20th century Indian CEO, you know, He's the power man, the corner office, the power man. And that's something which is a role that I'm clearly unsuited for. I mean, so the thing about it is that even when I used to work in star sports, I mean, they used to ask me that, what do you do out here? Because that's the first question they used to ask me because I didn't seem to be doing very much. And my standard answer for that was, I lend atmosphere, which was a suitably vague answer. But the point of it was, it's not that. It's that if you are with a group of people, if you can find people, A, the right people, finding the right people, getting them together and getting them excited about something is about, that's what a leader really needs to do. And then now you've got them excited about it, say, guys, what can we do? And get them to set goals to which they commit, not you. They need to commit to that goal. So you get these people, getting the right people, getting them excited, and then getting them to commit to something and then sort of going along with them on the journey. And that's that's the sense of how I worked and in many ways I have been very fortunate because the culture in Indian, in Indian corporates, most Indian corporates has over the last two decades turned much towards, much more towards my style of functioning, which comes more naturally to me than from this power office, let everyone stand up and salute when I walk into the office. Mm -hmm. So I think in, in many ways I've been fortunate that what's, what, what naturally came to me because of my personality and the truth of it is we can't really change very much what we how we deal with life you know we there's a certain basic ethos to how you operate and right. that ethos has actually has served me well now because as we move on and on i think the world is much more a much more cooperative place much more depends on how you get along with people different cultures different groups different geographies and deliver stuff and i think that works perfectly for me Superb. I mean, the journey of from Steve Ballmer to Satya Nadella, probably. Absolutely. Different management styles coming in and actually working. Mm -hmm. Steve, uh, I'm kind of running out of time. So let me turn this around and say that now, uh, now that you're here uh, and uh, we are looking at a lockdown, so I want to ask a question that's more about you. How are you personally dealing with it? Uh, I know some of it, but tell us how has this experience been the last few months for you being in India? I mean, yeah, my, my family um, are trapped in, in Europe at the moment, you know, so there's a bit of uncertainty. You, call, you talk about uh, volatile and uncertain in the VUCA world. And yeah, there, there's a lot of uncertainty about yeah, when they can come back and uh, the kids are doing, uh, you know, distance learning. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, it, it's been a very surreal period for, I think, most of us, you know, from the first period of, uh, you know, we're all obliged to save the world from our sofa. <laughs> You know, we have to stay home and, uh, you know, and, and not go out uh, to, um, you know, having the house to myself and, and, you know, kind of doing a lot of Zoom meetings. Uh, I think we're now at the stage where we're all Zoomed out. You know, and there, there is really clearly a limit of how long we, you know, we can work like that and how long these meetings can be. You know, and we made that mistake in the, in the early days, you know, like four or five hour Zoom meetings just don't work. And you see people you know, on their phones and, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's a non-starter, like, like before the physical meeting could be a day, you know, so. Um, and I, I suppose, uh, you know, the way I've uh, always looked at it is, um, you know, is, um, you know, I was very much influenced by a book called Good to Great um, a few years ago, you know, and, and the guy um, talks about, you know, a, a person um, called Stockdale who, you know, uh, goes down in, in Vietnam during the Vietnam War and uh, he was the only one that survived, uh, you know, five years of, uh, you know, real concentration camp. You know, and they're trying to work out why, why was he the only one, you know, and they call it the Stockdale paradox. Mm. Uh, he wasn't over-optimistic because he said the ones who were over-optimistic, those are the ones who died first. 
because they were so disappointed after six months that uh, we said, you know, I wasn't uh, over pessimistic either, you know, because uh, they, they were the ones that died second. He said, you know, I always had some kind of belief uh, that I would get through this, but it would be very tough. So mentally he was quite prepared, but he had some kind of inner belief, you know, and I think when crises like this happen, you know, you have to, you know, trust in your instincts and know that, you know, there is a way out and, and always, uh, you, you know, human nature find a way, you know. So I suppose relatively, you know, 10 weeks of lockdown uh, without my family isn't, the, the, you know, the end of the world, you know, but it, it's true. It's, it's, it's created a lot of challenges uh, on the business side. And yeah. uh, we still have only 30 stores out of 80 open, you know, and we're quite worried about what's happening in Delhi and, 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 and things like that, you know, so it's, it's yeah. not over. Thank you for sharing. Joy, your experience last 60 odd days, how has it been? Uh, well, I, I'm, I know much more about spin mops than I ever did in my life. <laughs> but I'm glad because as a very entitled Indian male coming from a middle class Indian family, I knew shockingly little about the kind of things that you need to do to run a house. And it's, 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 if it's something to learn, there's definitely something to learn out there. So it's not been easy, but uh, definitely it's, we, are, we are so entitled in India as middle class and sort of this thing, upper class India is so entitled, it's not funny. So be, uh, doing things myself has been great. Two is that I've, I've also tried to keep it very, very limited. I look at one day, two days, three days at a time keep it short, keep it say, okay, this is the amount of exercise I need to do. Because otherwise, if I don't have those short term goals, you know, if you start trying to think about what could happen, there is so much uncertainty out there in the market. The only thing I can be certain for is that this is the fruit I bought yesterday. This is what I'm going to get for dinner today and sort of plan it that way. literally break it up in little, little pieces, which yeah. are manageable pieces. Because the truth of it is a lot of people will tell you a lot of things nobody really knows how this is going to end up. Mm. The only one good thing is that I've learned, and this is, you know, a lesson from KKR. When you lose a lot of matches, every team goes through a streak when they're either winning or losing. And it happens. Teams go through streaks. That's the nature of, you know, sports. The thing about it is maintaining your shape when you're going through a bad streak. So basically what happens is when you go through a bad streak, a team can totally implode or they can maintain their shape and, at some point, luck will turn and things will start getting better again. Maintaining that shape is the secret. That you go on saying, okay, I have work to do, I have this to do, I have this to do. Keep maintaining that shape. At some point, things will turn. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you start believing that, okay, it's, it's doom and gloom and I'm never going to come back, then you just implode. That's my point. Super. So I'm almost out of time, but I will go out of turn and allow one more question. And this one is going to come from a wonderful person, Coach Petros. Are you here, Coach? We know Petros. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. And this is going to be a short question, and you will yeah. have to tell us three things to answer Petros. Go ahead, Coach. Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, good evening to everyone. And thank you for sharing all this valuable experience from different areas. Um, actually, I am from Greece. I lived here five years. And the question is the same uh, to both, but in different areas. Uh, the first, the question actually is about the culture, the sport culture here in India. Uh, first, uh, share to you, Joy. Uh, I would like to understand uh, because I face uh, that challenge because I coach mainly kids. So. I had to deal with a parent uh, that he was around my age, 45 years old, and he had a son that he was around 10, 11 years old. Uh, and uh, I wanted to explain to him uh, that sport, no matter what sport, is a way of living. Why I'm saying that? Because you know all of you better than me that uh, in, let's say, half a century back, uh, a big priority in India was uh, that you need to be educated, well-educated, uh, in order to survive. So uh, almost, and correct me if I'm wrong, nothing else was mattered on that. 
So someone who grows with that uh, view of the life, how, when he is a father now, uh, can you, as an outsider, explain to him that your son doesn't have to follow the same path, but he can, sports, can have uh, a piece of the circle of uh, the life. Uh, that is uh, the question for you, sir, because you have touched all the areas uh, in sport. You have deal uh, with parents, with uh, amateur athletes, semi-professional, even professional athletes. So you have a big range uh, uh, of experience and maybe you can help us also. And yeah. uh, before you answer, uh, to Steve, because as the uh, person before uh, said that uh, shopping is a sport in India, I would like to know, uh, because I assume, uh, Steve, a, a lot of people that they came in uh, Decathlon uh, to work, uh, maybe they didn't uh, uh, had so big relationship with the sport. So they, they said, it's a job, I will take a salary, but uh, in order to sell something, you need to believe that. So how Decathlon and you personally, you brought that culture to these specific persons that, look, there is a job, but sport is a way of living as well. So you need kind of trying it in order to convince a customer to try your product. Great, great Thank question. You. So, uh, but I have only limited time left for you. Yes, Jeremy. I know, I know. Uh, Not a problem, Coach. Thank you so much. Yes, let's start with Joy. Yeah, simply, it's a, it's a very, very valid question. It's a very tough question. It's exactly how Indians think. The only thing you can tell them is things are changing. Things like teamwork and all are now essential for people to grow. And sport is much more important now than it was in previous times. It's a far more rounded personality that people are looking at and therefore sport is important for your son or daughter, even though they may not play at the highest level. I think it's, it's still a tough challenge, but I think that's where you've got to appeal to them that the overall personality development is more important today because that is the single biggest challenge in India is convincing parents because either they think that they don't want to play sport or they think that my kid is the next uh, Tiger Woods or the next Messi. So, you know, in between these, convincing them that your kid can play sport normally and need not be a champion just to play it is, is a tough one. So, yeah. Thank it's you. always going to be tough, but that's what I would suggest. Thank Steve, you, Joy. Thank you, Joy. Steve. Thanks, Joy. Uh, yeah, I think, um, you know, that, that issue, uh, Petros, was really noticed uh, even before my arrival um, um, by a, a few of the team. I, I know um, a girl who could be still listening, actually, Sangeeta, was part of the reflection on that particular problem and um, uh, they, they started something quite innovative in Decathlon at the time which was called a sports recruitment day uh, which we still do for everybody even in finance legal property you know and and, and the idea was not, not to see if you're the the best sports person you know uh, there is lots of different activities early in the morning from uh, you know there's a beep test there's um, but the beep test is not to to see if you can be the best is to see some soft skills, you know, that you, you don't give up. Uh, then there's a lot of kind of group exercises. And again, it's not to see if you're the best individual player. It's more the soft skills, you know, can you play in a team? Can you communicate? Uh, and how can you federate everybody, you know? And this, this for, you know, 80, 90% of the cases, you know, even, you know, we, we do have some people who are maybe chartered accountants and say, why do I have to come and, and uh, do this uh, at six in the morning? But you know, we're so passionate about sport and there's so many things you can get from sport which are also applicable in business, you know. And, um, and then, then we have, uh, you know, something which is come and live our life um, where it's a kind of a first month or two period where, you know, we, we, we're prepared to pay and, and they can discover, you know, because the best MBA sometimes um, sees Decathlon as the international sports company. But if you start in the store, you, you put your hands in the boxes, you know, you're, you're a retailer. You know, so we try to do those two things really to try and make sure that, you know, that the sport and the, you know, the understanding of what the role is, is, is more aligned. And, you know, a lot of countries outside of India in Decathlon have, 
have followed this and it means our turnover level is, is, is has gone down, you know, because that mm. is the, the huge cost in retail. Sound fantastic. We have overshot by 26 minutes. It's unprecedented, but I think uh, it's fantastic to see 48 people on our participant list. But I have to close now, otherwise we'll never close. It's been an absolute pleasure having you gentlemen. Uh, thank you for coming, thank you for sharing. It's been one of my favorite sessions, very insightful. And you've really told us stories and shared insights which are really very, very meaningful. So very grateful for your time, very grateful for your uh, interest in joining. So thank you so much. Thank you for my audience attendees for staying on. Amazing question, my apologies. We never managed to fit all the questions, uh, but I think we do our best. So thank you for coming. We're back next Friday with two CHROs. We are going to shift gears and talk about organization culture with the CHRO of Mercedes Benz and the CHRO and site head, India head for Hudson's Bay Company, a fashion retail house and a car manufacturer talking about employee engagement. So be back then. Thank you for your time. And I'm going to sign off for now. Lovely meeting you today and see you soon with the real beer in the real world. Exactly. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. And all the best. Have a great weekend. See you. Bye. Bye.